We are looking at engaging citizens in decision making for this session. Um, obviously, with all this fantastic data, surely we can use it for public good. Senator, why don't you kick us off? How would you like to use machine learning to just better inform the policies and the way that you can govern in New York State? Great question. I mean, we all know the uh, transformative um, way that AI could be used. And when we put that in government use, we can actually transform the way the government can deliver services. Um, at its core, the government is responsible for public health, public education, public safety, public transportation, I can go on and on, right? But AI can actually boost the way uh, the delivery of that service goes. Uh, using data analytics and machine learning, we can see trends pop up and then make policy decisions based off of that. Now, as a senator, like I hear complaints from my constituents all the time. The top three always start with, uh, I am late for work because the train didn't show up on, that, on time, or the trains are too packed. What can you do to help? I can think of AI uh, you know, being used in the transportation sector where it can predict when a rail is going to be broken or it can predict when a repair needs to be done on a train before it breaks down and that can completely change um, you know, the service given to uh, my constituents. Well, someone who knows about how you need to use data is this man next to you, John. Um, why don't you lecture the senator in how he can better use data for public policy? I, I don't know if I want to start lecturing the senator. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, before we jump to how useful AI can be, we have to remember the fact that AI can only be as useful as the data that informs it. And for many countries in the world, the data still are not there. According to The Economist, in Tanzania, only one in eight births are recorded. In Niger, only 3% of deaths are recorded. Think about that. Fundamental data that policymakers need in order to drive decision making doesn't exist. In fact, all across Africa, 60% of the indicators that exist in order to support the SDGs aren't being monitored throughout Africa. So for us to do better policy making and to leverage AI in that process, there are still many parts of the world where we need to establish really good data. And that leads us to who should be collecting that data. Lisa, let's bring you in here. So how can data better inform decisions, but also should it be up to the politicians, like our senator here, or should it be private companies? Well, stepping back a bit, if you think about it, most of our countries have 18th century politics, 19th century institutions, 20th century technology, it's changing, and 21st century problems and solutions. And if you're listening to the president of the World Bank, he talked about the pipes, the plumbing, and what you're talking about is the plumbing. Like, how can governments deal with the plumbing? And I have six quick points. One. Um, it's critical to get the data um, to have talent. And you have to have a mindset that citizens' data is important and the actual skills to do it. Number two, you have to work as a team. The number one reason um, we're not seeing the changes in use of uh, data in the way we want is they say governments are too siloed. They can't get the data, and when they have it, it's siloed. The third quick one, is they have to see tech as a tool. It's the why of the technology. I worry a little bit in some of these discussions, it's the, the tail wagging the dog, like why do we need this data? That's super important. The next is, um, I think there's just such opportunity to get targeted data um, to do much better. You have to have it, but once you have it, you'll know how to get it. And the last one is really um, trust. You know, in order for governments to work, there has to be trust. And in order for there to be trust, there has to be engagement and trust built. And I think one of the challenges um, is if we see too much of the data used in service delivery versus thinking about data, listening to people, whether it's in bits and bytes or sitting here in real places, 
entire, in the entire experience people have with their governments. Well, let's build on that. Trust. How do we build trust between governments and citizens so that data can be used efficiently and correctly? Well, that is a very difficult thing, especially in the US where there is a bit of concern <laughs> among our citizens when it comes to the government, right? There is that sense that, hey, we can't trust the government, they are doing this, they're doing that. But when it comes to uh, providing uh, a public service, right, there's more uh, trust building there. Um, and one of the first things that we need to do is if AI is going to be implemented in uh, making lives better, the constituent needs to know that they're not actually interacting with a human being. They need to know that this is artificial intelligence because I'm already seeing certain sectors using AI and people just don't know that it's the AI making the decision for them. Like, I mean, back home, uh, when it comes to healthcare decisions or even uh, auto insurance, uh, certain algorithms and AI make a decision to either allow a patient to have uh, a certain surgery or not, or whether the insurance covers it or not. So there is a lot here that the government needs to do in order to balance the benefits and the risks. I mean, in my head, I just went straight to bias. Um, that sounds really scary. Yeah, it is. Um, what should the private sector do? What should the collaboration be, John? In terms of? Private sector and governments working together in terms of collecting data and being able to use it. Well, I mean, if you don't mind, the topic of trust is something that I find really fascinating. In fact, Gallup did a study a long time ago that said, what are the main needs of followers? Hope, compassion, stability were among the top ones, but trust was also in there. And I think what's most important, especially for public sector officials, because trust is collapsing everywhere, mm -hmm. systematically. I mean, it's almost everywhere you turn. And this isn't even a public sector issue, it's a private sector issue. Uh, people don't trust any institutions anymore. And for us to rebuild it, I think we have to ask ourselves, how do you define it? So I actually did an activity. I asked AI, chat GPT, <laughs> what did it, it come up help with? me define trust. And it came up with two things. I mean, one is, can you get the job done? And then the second one is, can you make sure you don't stab me in the back? <laughs> and I think the problem in terms of where trust has fallen flat is, Number one, people don't believe uh, many institutions because they feel stabbed in the back. You know, if you take, for example, how data is produced, um, there was a survey that was done and they found that 2% of academics admit that they falsify data. Uh, how, who do you trust at a moment like that? But I think the next piece is they don't feel like officials are getting the job done. You know, I live in Washington, D.C., and right now three cars are stolen on average every single day. It's hard to feel safe in Washington, D.C. In fact, according to Axios, um, D.C. has become more dangerous than Detroit. And so for trust to be rebuilt, number one, you got to feel like you're not going to get stabbed in the back. But number two, whatever the basic demands of a functioning society are, like crime, those things need to be addressed first. And when we come to trust, I mean, the politicization, I think, as well, particularly in the U.S., but around the world, and we're in a big year for democracy. I think it's four billion people are eligible to largest vote this ever, year. Yeah, largest ever elections around the world. So let's discuss that. Are you concerned about the risks around data and AI, given this is such a big year for democracy, Lisa? Of course. I mean, people are really concerned. I, I'm concerned in it for ways that may not be so obvious, though. I mean, clearly we have the issue of deep fakes. And kind of the jury's out a bit about whether that actually changes people's minds. It often creates a confirmation bias. I think one of the biggest um, challenges we have in our politics right now, and I um, live in Germany, I'm American, I work in p politics and government in 170 countries, so I'm, I'm saying this writ large. This isn't just about we happen to all be Americans here. 
One of the things we're seeing is the amount of hate online and the amount of deep fakes, particularly towards women politicians. We have about 80% of women politicians getting just hit over and over with bots and real people threatening to kill them. And um, we see this late, late list on the, on the Nikki Haley trail. And the thing I'm most concerned about this in the short term is it's turning great people away from politics or from public service. And so I'm concerned in any business, in any government, in any sports team, in any, anything you do, you need talent. We need the best talent right now in government, the absolute best. We need to pay for it. I'm not just saying that, that more money gets better um, talent always. We need the intrinsically motivated people. But can I just tell quick, two quick stories that I think are a bit of a counter and bright spot, away from the election, but it's connected. So we work at a political peer-to-peer um, -peer learning platform. We work with public servants from over 170 countries. And I can't share the name of the country yet, because it's not public. But they've been experimenting um, with machine learning and more tailored messages, more frequent to, government, to their citizens. And what you're seeing is the trust go up. And I think it's a little bit to what you were talking about, but, but a different phrase. When government can be more proximal, they feel like, oh, they're paying attention to me. And, and this is even when the government got the, some of the facts wrong, they still felt more connected to. We need government to be more connected. Second quick story, um, uh, country, I can't name it either, decided, oh, there's not trust, the, the agenda's off, the politicians don't know the agenda. So they did a big nationwide, I think they had about 65% of the citizens go everywhere from coffee clutches to go online. They came up with the 24 agenda items to deliver to the politicians. Like, you don't know what we need, this is what we need. They showed the politicians from different parties and 23 of them were things that were already happening. And I think the promise of AI, generative AI, machine learning might be that we can do a better job of communicating in a much more iterative process what's going on, how do we adapt, how do we change. This is what matters to you, person whose job just went away from AI. Here's free money to go get reskilled. We can bring government much more proximal and much more empathetic to the people. John, you've written a book, and I promise you, John has neither told me to plug this book, and he didn't even tell me about it. I found it online. You've written a book, Blind Spot, The Global Rise of Unhappiness and How Leaders Missed It, which I think feeds in beautifully yeah. into what you were saying. Do you think people will be happier as a result of governments being able to communicate more directly with the data that they have? Well, first of all, the entire premise of the book, and uh, now you don't have to go out and get it, is... <laughs> is we see one of the most concerning rises in our database that we've ever seen, which is the global rise of negative emotions. We ask people about how much anger, stress, sadness, and pain that they experience on a daily basis. And for the past 10 years, we've seen a 10-point increase in those negative feelings. But think about that. If that had been a 10-point increase in unemployment for the entire world, it would be headlines everywhere. Yet when there is a global rise of misery, it almost goes totally untalked about by global leaders because we just haven't had great metrics on it. Um, now to your point about what, how will policy affect this and will there be a change in attitude? I think there can be. You know, one of the leaders that's celebrated at least by people within that particular country is Najib Bukele in El Salvador. Um, in El Salvador, the homicide rate was the highest in the world. And now it's among the lowest in the world. I think it's six people now die per 100,000. And the reason is, is that there was such a focus on law and order. And we can see in our data that it's actually changing the very mood of the nation. Why? People feel better. I mean, of, of as much uh, criticism as Maslow has received on Maslow's hierarchy of needs, he was also pretty spot on about a lot of things, including the very need to feel safe. Um, and it's embodied qualitatively by one gentleman that was interviewed on the streets of San Salvador. He put his hands in the air and he said, I love this man because I can actually freely do business in my country now. And so, again, I think if policymakers can focus on the delivery of very basic human needs, then yes, I think undoubtedly you will see an increase in the general mood of a society. Senator, I mean, I don't think you'll be using El Salvador necessarily as your model. I think the prisons are quite packed there. But um, 
what would you like to see going ahead? I know you're running for Congress. So what would you like to see that's different to bring about greater happiness empowered by machine learning? Well, let me start off by saying this. You know, I've been in public service of some kind for the past 13 years. And, uh, you know, I jumped into politics to help people. And this is what my constituents in any, like, uh, community wants. When they send someone over to the capital to do things, they need to come back with the results. All right? They need to actually deliver for their constituents. And right now, what I see in DC is just chaos. It's a circus, and I can say that. All right? And we need people that want to actually help the country there. Uh, to, to be able to, to be sane, you know, that's the, the minimum standard. Be sane, do what is right, and deliver to your constituents back home. That's why I'm doing what I'm doing right now. All right, I think we've got a final thought from everyone. Lisa, if we meet again next year, and let's hope we do, will things be better or worse? Well, I'm a pathological optimist, so I would say um, they'll be better. You the look pained as you say that. I'm pained. <laughs> the thing that I'm thinking a lot about, and we come from very different countries, right? People in different places. I'll tell you the thing I'm most worried about and what I'm doing about it. What I'm wor most worried about is cynicism setting in. It's a little bit of some of the negative emotions, and we know that there's this learned hopelessness it's a psychological term that I feel a lot of people are in right now. And it's this downward doom loop. And it's a choice, right? It's a choice on if we're going to stay in the doom. And the three ways that you can um, deal with cynicism, one is through joy, actually having joy. I think about what role does government play in joy in our communities, not hedonism. The second is community. People are six times more likely to be polarized if they're lonely. What roles do we have in building community in every single thing that we do? And the last is gratitude. What can we be thankful for? And what I worry about all this data discussion is it's taking away from the core human things. Tech is a tool. I think it's great promise with AI, but we can't forget we're humans and what we need. John, you've got one minute. Final thought. What's the question again? <laughs> Where are we going to be this time next year? We've got the eternal optimist, pain though she is to express it. Um, with the advent of machine learning and how it's going to be used in public policy, will we be in a better position next year? Or this time next year, are we just going to be talking about all the terrible things that happened in all of the elections this year? I, I'm a bit of an optimist as well. You know, there's that famous quote that's attributed to Winston Churchill and he said it about Americans and he says Americans always get it right but only after they've tried virtually every <laughs> option <laughs> and I think to some extent that's true of all of humanity I mean sometimes it's a little ugly to watch but we go out and we experiment with every type of government with every type of business model with every type of societal structure and throughout all of this experimentation, we observe each other and eventually get it right. And I think a lot of that will come true. The other thing is, is that this is the part I have faith in humanity. Everybody's really concerned right now about AI, but those concerns would have been equally fitting for just the internet. I mean, of course, there's that famous meme that goes around and it says, trust everything that you read on the internet by Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> well, of course, the same is true with AI. When you're using generative AI, it even has a line at the end that says, please know that this is susceptible to incorrect information. I mean, humanity can read if they're using that. So I, I do have faith in humanity that when we see videos, we know that there are things that we might need to question now, and we just need to reframe uh, how we use the new technology. So I think we'll be okay. Are we going to have a full house and optimism here? I mean, you said Washington's at DC is a, is a circus. Yes. Um, <laughs> so you've got a lot to look so forward to. So with the 25 seconds I have left, I hope government in the next year or so uh, decides to prioritize actually improving the lives of constituents instead of spending billions of dollars at war around the world. Mm. Well, that's, that is... that's my, those are my thoughts. Well, I think that was a great way to end. Thank you. Um, 
thank you everyone for joining us this afternoon. I mean, so many challenges, so many risks, so many scary thoughts, but ultimately tech is a force for good. And I think, I think it will be. Thank you very much thank to you, you all.